Welcome, everybody, to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello, everyone. I'm Ray Shasho. Welcome to the show where we spotlight legendary and up-and-coming music artists and authors. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552 or visit www.publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Our very special guest today is legendary music mogul Miles Copeland III. Miles was born in London, England to Miles X. Copeland, Jr., a CIA officer from Birmingham, Alabama, and Lorraine Copeland, who was in British intelligence. Due to Miles Jr.'s profession, the family moved throughout the Middle East, in particular Syria, Egypt, and Lebanon. As a result, Miles and his brothers became fluent in Arabic. One of the most one of the music industry's most influential figures, Miles Copeland's career in management stretches back 44 years to 1969 in London, where he represented progressive rock bands such as Wishbone Ash, Al Stewart, Climax Blues Band, Band Renaissance, Curved Air, and Caravan until he jumped ship, landed in the turbulent ocean of punk, and worked with the Sex Pistols, The Clash, Blondie, and many, many more. In 1978, he became manager of his brother's storage band, the police, and uh, shepherded them to become one of the biggest bands of the 1980s. The success of the police and the novel methods used to break them enabled Miles to found IRS records. In the next few years, the company had hits with the Buzzcocks, the English Beat, the Cramps, Fine Young Cannibals, Wall of Voodoo, Timbuk3, R.E.M., and a number one album with the all-girl group, the Go-Go's. He continued to manage Sting uh, in his solo efforts through seven blockbuster albums and introduced Sting to Algerian singer Sheb Mahami. Their collaboration bloomed with Desert Rose, whose worldwide success was attributed to Miles' innovative corporate deal with Jaguar. In all, Miles can rightfully claim to have been involved in the sale of over 150 million albums. Miles currently owns and operates CIA Copeland International Arts. Miles Copeland is also the manager of the Anderson Ponty Band, which features legendary performers John Anderson and Jean-Luc Ponty. Please welcome to the Ray Shash Show, show legendary American entertainment executive, Miles Copeland. Thank you for being here, Miles. Hey, nice to hear from you. <laughs> You're going through <laughs> my history. Did I really do all that stuff? <laughs> yeah, I think so. That's what the uh, internet says. <laughs> uh, well, I, I guess I guess it's yeah, I guess you got to believe the internet, right? <laughs> well, I was lucky enough to chat with John Anderson about a week ago and guitarist uh, uh, Jamie Glazer a few days ago. Uh, I talked to Jean Luc during the Kickstarter campaign for the new album. And now I get to chat to the boss, to their manager, which is really, really cool. How did you get involved with the band? Well, John, I've known him. I've known John Luke Ponte for some time. I I did a project with him years ago with Stanley Clark and Al DiMiola called The Rite of Strings. Right. And uh, he was always just a sweet guy, you know, just a really good guy and a brilliant musician. I'd always had respect for him. And then I, I, I ran into uh, John Anderson about six months ago, and we started talking back and forth, and John kept saying, I, I know I need a manager, I know I need a manager, and <clears throat> I kept saying, well, you know, if you need one, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, one day he calls me up and says, look, let's do something here, I've got my project with John Luke, and I said, well, that's great, I've always liked John Luke, so I listened to the record, and I thought they were great, and I thought, you know what, why not, you know, so... Um, I got involved in helping him in his current tour. I, I was not involved in the Kickstarter project back then. Okay. So I'm sort of a newbie to the project. I, I got involved about four months ago and uh, have been helping them kind of make sense out of the Anderson Ponty tour from a touring standpoint. You know, I mean, as you know, most of the artists in the music business are sort of 
lost their royalty streams from selling CDs because that seems to have gone away. And now it's right. the touring is really what it's all about. That's that's the livelihood now. So and that's my expertise. So that's really what I've been helping them with. Yeah, it's amazing. In the old days, uh, you know, the the livelihood was in the albums. You know, and the and then the the uh, I guess the concerts were just a way to sell more records. So that's why concert tickets were so cheap. Because I remember them. The standard concert ticket back in my day was six fifty, five fifty, and four fifty. <laughs> you know, that, that's yeah. It. Well, I think what's happened basically is that is that you know uh, you used to tour to sell records. You know, right? And you know, like on the on the shows, you would make sure your records were in the stores. You wouldn't be selling them at the shows because. If you sold them at the shows, people wouldn't buy them at the store, which means it wouldn't trigger the charts. So, you know, everything was focused on selling records in the record store, you know. And touring was, a, you know, could be profitable. and People made money touring, but it was always looked upon as an adjunct to selling records. Exactly. Now, of course, there's hardly any record stores, you know. So, you know, if you want to buy a CD, you know, and you're young, I mean... You're you're an anomaly, you know. The old the older people still buy CDs, I guess. They get it from Amazon or the few record stores that are left. But for the most part, <clears throat> that, those days and now it's all digital and streaming and all that, you know. You, you know what gets me is some people put the you know a new album will come out and it'll be on YouTube the whole album brand new. I mean, and anybody can listen to it, you know. And, you know, a lot of times when a new album comes out from an artist and they, they want to send it to me, you know, or if they forget to send it to me or something, I say, don't worry about it. It's probably on YouTube, and it is, which, which right. is, I, you know, I just can't believe that's happening, you know? Well, I had a complaint um, uh, last week from a, a guy that, because, um, you know, on the, we, we've taken like the first three or four or five rows on, on, mm -hmm. on some of the shows, and we do like a VIP ticket. Right. For people who want to meet the band and, you know, hang out and get more special stuff, you know. So, obviously, the price for a VIP ticket is higher than it is for, you know, the normal seats, you know. But we're playing in, like, 2,000 seaters, so everybody can see very well anyway. But, you know, some people really like those front seats, you know. So, I mean, the price really wasn't that bad, but this guy sends me an email saying, you know, he thought it was really a liberty that he had to, buy, to sit front row, he had to pay extra on this and that. And, I sort of emailed back and said, look, you know, I, I, I totally get your point, but the reality is if we can't make extra money from the, from the, some of the tickets, we can't afford to tour because there's no right. money coming from records. And you're getting the music for free on the Internet probably. You can't have it both ways, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And that, that's really the dilemma for artists now. Nobody really likes to have high ticket prices, but then again, they can't make money selling CDs, so what are you going to do? Exactly. Yeah, it, it's, the industry is all screwed up, and it has been for such a long time now. You know, uh, well, I mean, music is more readily available now, and in some ways, yep, you know, yep. you could say from a fan standpoint, you know, it's much easier to get the music, and it may be cheaper overall for the, you know, if you're if you're listening and you're paying for a streaming system and you can get any song you want, right, and at any time you want, you know, I mean, from a fan standpoint, it's really great. From the artist standpoint or from the songwriter standpoint, right. it's become a tougher business. You know, it has, it really has. <laughs> But you know, as a as a journalist myself, it, it it has made things a lot easier. You know, I I mean, I can get information like you know in, in a second, which is great. Which I you know gives me more. I can you know do more things and and handle more interviews and you know it's it, in that way. But I I feel for the artist because I'm also an author and I and I I can kind of see how you can get kind of you know kind of screwed. <laughs> you know, I think I think one of the things. That, that's really noticeable is that the the older artists, you know, um, <clears throat> who were, never really grew up in the Internet age, you know, right. they, they find right. it much more difficult to really uh, get into Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and all these sort of things where, you know, the younger artists who have grown up with that, they live on those things, you know. Exactly. Yeah. And, and you, see, you see the effect even in the election right now. You know, mm -hmm. Donald Trump is tweeting every day. I know. You know. So he's yeah. in the news every day. Right. So I, I say to John and to John Luke, you know, guys, you know, you got to put, you got to spend some time on the internet every day, you know. Right. And uh, you know they do, but it, it's tougher for them. Whereas the young, young, you don't have to tell them anything. They're just all these young bands are on the internet all over the place, you know. So um, you know, that that's really one of the dilemmas of to, of today's business is that it means that the artists 
has a lot more access to the fan now, but it means also they have to spend more time doing it. Yeah, they do. I, I, see, I see what you mean because the, uh, the younger bands can do that, but that's all they can do. I mean, they, they don't have the luxury of having record companies promoting them anymore, like in the old days either. You know, yeah, and the exactly, old days, yeah. yeah, and then that's that's what they're missing. And that, to me, I would rather have the record companies promoting me than getting on the internet. You know, yeah, I mean, well, it I, used I, to be, you know, you'd get a record deal and you think, okay, yeah. I made it. You know, right. you, right. and then you'd hustle the record company to do all the work. You know, and right. then you, when they broke your record, then you'd go tour. Exactly. Now it's like, oh no, 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 you got to do the work. And if you get some action going, now we can try and sell something. <laughs> exactly. So it's you know, really put the onus yeah. back on the artist, you know. And, same, and I think for people like John Anderson and John Luke right. Ponte, I mean, they're happy. They like to tour. They like to build an audience. They like to be out there. And so, which is one of the reasons, you know, I, I got involved with them because they still, you know, they're not content to sit back at home and do nothing. You know, exactly. they still have a lot of music in them and they want to do stuff. And I said, well, if you guys are active and you want to do stuff, you know, count me in because you know none of us could sit back on our laurels anymore. We got to be out there and do stuff. Yeah. And they do, you know. The thing that ticks me off the most is is there's so many legendary artists that are still producing great music, but they're not they're not they're not being heard, you know because you know mainstream radio is not going to play them. They're going to play the same old oldies over and over again. I I used to be a DJ back in the in late 70s. I, I did top 40, you know, and in and the selection was it was pretty good even back in uh, the late 70s. You know what I could play on the radio. You know it was the new wave time. I played a lot. You know I played the Police and uh, the Cars and Blondie and and disco was still happening, but it was still good music, you know, Donna Summer and things like that. But, you know, today, you know, you know, a legendary artist puts out a new album, he can't sell it the way, you know, he's accustomed to selling it, you know, because oh, nobody on mainstream it. radio is going to play it, which really yeah. makes me mad. <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why it's important, you know, for artists to tour and to keep touring and right. to, you know, open up and, and, and to really work the Internet, you know, and to yep. take advantage of the new media, you know, because you can reach people. You just have to spend a bit more time doing it yourself. You know, you can't right. really turn it over to the record companies anymore or exactly. whatever, you know. Well, there isn't so many it, record companies left. <laughs> no, I mean, they've all merged and ended yep. up with, you know, um, you know, I mean, I know so many of my compatriots in the music business are now selling houses or something, you know. They're all <laughs> right. <laughs> well, so, you'll be happy to know every interview that I do is is posted on YouTube and it's also on iTunes for everybody to you know to to listen to. So and I and I tweet my brains out. I'm on Facebook. I got like four accounts, and you know I do my best promoting the artist. You know when they come on my show. So that that's got to help a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I think I think the other the other reality of of today's world is that. You know, in the old days, you could, you know, when there were three TV stations, you know, you could right. get on one station, and you were made, you know. Exactly. exactly. Now, <laughs> now, you know, even with radio, there's so many radio stations, and there's some, you yeah. know, so now you have to work so many smaller things. Right. Um, and, and just keep active all the time. Right. I mean, we used to, as a manager, you know, years ago, we used to worry about overexposure, mm -hmm. you know. Well, now it's impossible. You can't be overexposed, you know. Um, there's so many outlets, you know, you could literally be huge on one outlet and nobody's heard of you on another you know so you really have to work everything so it's 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 all these little incremental things that add up so i mean your radio show and a little magazine here and there whatever you right. add all these things together and it means something you know you can't just sit back and have one interview and one you know maybe time magazine gives you a feature right that's just not enough anymore you got to do everything yeah, what i like about our show it's an hour you know it's an hour about you know the guest has a whole hour to promote anything he wants you know, that, which is unheard of. If you go on, uh, you know, a, a, a huge station, you might, you're lucky to get, what, 10 minutes? <laughs> and right. I, I don't think, you know, how much is 10 minutes really going to really, really do? I, I liked on, on the, on, um, you, you did an interview and you were talking about gross impressions. I, I really enjoyed hearing you talking about that because I do PR also myself. And, you know, and, and you are right. Today's a, a totally different, you know, even CNN, I mean, the way they repeat the same stories over and over again, it's like it's like brainwashing, you know. I mean, they all do it. They're all guilty of doing that. But uh, well, they do, they, I think they do it for two reasons. One is because they figure the attention span of anybody is is right. pretty short. Number one, two, they don't expect people to watching twenty four seven. But three, they're on twenty four seven, so it's yeah, pretty hard to find news. You know, if you if your radio show was twenty four hours long. 
you'd run out of stuff pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's you true. Know? They, they so, should be a little bit more selective as far as some of the things they put on the air, though, because there's a lot of news happening, you know. Yeah, and that, I know. Well, and that's, that's why yeah. I, I tend to watch, you know, I watch Al Jazeera, I watch RT, right. I watch Channel of, of France, Van Katz, I watch BBC. Right. I watch as many, and, and I, you know, I, I always jump around between stations to see what the hell's going on in the rest of the world, too, you know. You have to be. You know, I, you know, I, I think, and, and I may be wrong on this, I, I, I just can't see... You know, um, CNN, you know, TV, CNN, uh, Fox on TV, lasting. Because the kids today are on their phones constantly. They don't give a crap about the news. They really don't. Most, most of them are, uh, you know, checking their phones. And if anything, they'll just look at the headlines. But I can't That's probably see... probably why I mean, Donald Trump is tweeting so much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he, he, he's learned the, the, the value of, of that. And, it gets, and, and the tweets create their own momentum, you know. They, they do. They do. I, I think that's the only way you're going to get to the kids is, is by tweeting yeah. and getting on Facebook. Even Facebook is not as popular with, it, with the younger generation anymore. It's all an older generation yeah, right, thing, right. Though, I think. The Anderson Potty yep. Band um, begins USA dates. Uh, I believe it's April 28th in Tucson, Arizona, and winds down in Quebec City, Canada, around May 27th. I'm still hoping there's a, another leg to the tour where you guys are going to pick up some southern dates, especially. Well, we we actually I had, uh, was talking to the agent about doing because uh, we had an offer to do South America, and I said, look, let's stop in Florida, let's do some Florida dates on the sure. way. Sure. Yeah. So we, you know, absolutely, Florida is a is a place we'd love to come to. You know, I told John if you need any help with some of the venues, I, you know, like I got Corky Lang a, a gig in 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 uh, Largo, which is near Clearwater, and right, cause I know I know I know a lot of the uh, you know the promoters and you know down in my area, so you know, I can I can well, kind of we'll help. Keep, we'll keep you in mind, you know. Okay. I mean, the thing about that group, you know, which is interesting, is um, I mean, John is obviously a singer, but John Luke is a master musician. You know, yes. One of one of the things that I've really noticed in music, particularly from the days when when I was starting off with the first bands, you know, the, the Wishbone Ashes and all those mm-hmm. sort of bands, is that the the musician was very much at the forefront. You know, when when Eric Clapton, Eric Clapton was known as a guitar player, not as a singer. You know. Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, Jeff Beck and Rich, all, all these guitar players were, were a really big deal. And the musician was a big deal. Now it seems to be all about the singer, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, for me, I, I, I like bands where there's really, you're going to see some great musicianship as well, you know. I mean, the other thing I'm doing is a thing called Generation Acts. Right. Which is five major guitar players that, are, that, that we, we launch April, April 8th. We, go in, we have 27 shows in America. It's Steve Vai, wow. um, Zach Wild, Nuno Betancourt, Ingve mm-hmm. uh, Malstein, and Tosin Abbasi. Five guitar players with a house band, and we're going across America, you know. And it's all about the guitar, you know, the, right. the musician, you know. Right. That's what we're missing. So, you, you know, we, yeah. and that's, that, that's the trouble with mainstream radio, which, you know, bugs the hell out of me. <laughs> you know, you know I, I don't like auto-tune for the singers, and you know what? There, they, there are some singers out there that the little pop girl singers that at, you know, like um, Ariana Grande. You know, if, she, if they didn't put her in that role as a little pop girl singer and gave her something intelligent to sing, she's got a good voice. You know, yeah, I mean, there are yeah, you know, there, there are some great singers out there. I mean, the other thing that I I, I always find a little bit boring. You know, it's like okay, you know, you, you see these you know singers like from Britney Spears to whoever, and they, and they, right. and they Beyonce, whatever, they all have all this dancing on them, and they're all like pumping out their crotch and God knows what, you know. And you're right. thinking, God, you know, you're, you're a good singer and you got a good song, but right. do you really have to go through all those gyrations? You know, then Adele comes along and she's just pretty straightforward and she's great, you know. And look how big she is, you know. It, yeah, she exactly. Tells them all, you know. And you think, wow, okay, now there's a real artist, you know. So a lot of it's just got to be fluff, you know. Right. And, uh, right. It's all fluff. Yeah, uh, and the same thing with. Uh, um, oh gosh, what's her name? Uh, Cyrus, she, you know, with the tongue, the tongue bit. I don't, know, I don't know why she has to stick, you know, Miley Cyrus with her tongue. She has to stick her tongue out all the time. What is that? Is she imitating Gene Simmons? What is she doing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, there she was, a cute little girl in Disney, and all of a sudden she wanted yeah. to go show that she was a woman and, like, went that over the top, sense. you know, and you're thinking, oh, gee, did you really have to do that, you know? <laughs> you know. Go ahead. 
you were involved in in some motion pictures as well, right? Didn't you produce a couple couple pictures and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I, I I I did a bunch of them, but but right. uh, I never found that that was you know there's too many. It, I, I guess because a movie, every even even the cheaper budget movies are pretty yeah. damn expensive compared to making a record. That'd so everybody's tough. sort of afraid, you know. And so some, I remember one audition we had where we had, you know, a, a girl came in and she was fantastic for the part. And I thought, okay, she's got the part, you know. And uh, and and one of my people, the financier, looked at me and said, well, no, she can't have it because she's not known. I need a name, you know. So another girl comes in who wasn't as good, but she had a name, and so we had to go with her, you know. So right, right. It, it's not the latitude that you have in music where you can really go with your gut mm -hmm. just isn't there, you know, in the, in the case yeah. of film because there's too much money involved, you know. So you find that sometimes you're, you're, you're going for things that aren't really great, but you're stuck because, you know, you, you need that name to help sell the movie, you know. Right, exactly. I mean, the beauty of the music business has been that, you know, you can, you can, I mean, with the police, for instance, the first record cost me $3,000, mm -hmm. you know, uh, if, if it had, if it had cost me a million, I never would have recorded it. Right. You know, so the music business, you can, you can actually start with very little money and build and make yourself famous, you know, whereas in movies, it's, that's pretty near impossible, you know, so that it's a different world, you know, you have to start with money in the, in the film business. Did you think the police were going to be as successful as they were when, when you first started with them? When I first started, no, because they didn't really have many songs. It wasn't right. until I went, I just, they were they were really up against it, and it looked like it was going to fall apart, and I just said to them, look, why don't we just record a record, you mm -hmm. know? And I had, I found a studio that said for me that uh, they would, they would uh, make me the record for $3,000, and Wow. You know, and and it was a doctor who who had a studio in the back of his of his medical practice, and he wanted to be an engineer, producer, and so he said, "Look, I'll make you a deal." So we went and did this thing, and then I went in and I heard Roxanne, and that just changed everything. The minute I heard that song, I thought, "Okay, now we're talking." You know, the group hated the song; they thought that it was a loser. And I just said, "Guys, that's your <laughs> song." And they all looked at me like I was crazy. But of course, that that is that 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 did change everything. You know, so. But again, yeah, I mean, like I say, that uh, that record cost us three thousand dollars, and 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 it was the launching platform for the police. What an investment! <laughs> yeah, what an investment! Your I mean, the funny the funny thing was actually that I didn't have the three thousand dollars because I was at that, po <laughs> at that point broke. Right. Um, and uh, I pleaded with the engineer to say, "Look, why don't you take a percentage on the record instead of the three thousand dollars?" Right. And he refused. <laughs> so oh I, my God! He blew he that refused. one. refused. <laughs> so I had to struggle and you know sell posters on the street and God knows what to scrape up the three thousand dollars, and yeah. I finally paid it right. And uh, of course, the record became huge. And then about four years later, his, his he got a manager, and now all of a sudden he, he you know he was a famous producer because he was on the Police album. And uh, so his manager comes to me and says, "Okay." We want to get that royalty that you offered on the first album, and I, I was, I was incensed. I literally, it was the only time in my life I've thrown a guy out of my office. I said, I pleaded with you, I begged you, I, I had no money. I was, I, you know, I, I needed you to take a percentage, and you guys said no. So you know what? Get out of my office. Get out of my office. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I talked with Andy, uh, Andy Summers, back in 2014, and he was pretty adamant, no more police reunions or anything. <laughs> was there any friction between Andy and, uh, and Sting? It, it kind of sounded well, that way. Well, you know way. what? The thing, the <laughs> thing was is that, is that the, 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 the sort of animosities were always overblown because it made, right. better, news. It made better news, actually, you know. And, um, but... When, when I and Sting separated, he had a manager who was very insecure, which was really a publicist girl, you know. And and right. I think the wife, the wife is, you know, always been a little insecure too, because she's got this hot boyfriend, you know, or hot husband basically, and was always fearful that some girl would pop in, you know. So they had all these paranoias around them. Oh, geez. And and uh, when he and I separated, I think the 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 new team were very afraid that Sting and I would get back together again, so they wanted right. to keep me away. And they didn't really like the idea of the police because then again it might just be out of there. It, it would have a couple more people that had a bit of control. So he's been sort of 
isolated in his little world, you know. And mm-hmm. so I think it's wrong, not really an animosity thing, really. It's just that the kind of players in the game have a vested interest in keeping right. us all separate, you know. So I think that's really what it's all about. Yeah, he told me, I said, I, I said, Andy, is there any chance of another reunion with the police? He said, it sort of seems impossible. I don't think so, and I'm not hoping so. Sting calls me every day, and I tell him not to call me again and leave me alone. <laughs> That's what he said. But he, but he said if, if, if he wants to play in Vegas in, like, 2025, maybe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, Sting made enough money on his own, so he's right, okay, right. you know, and yeah. And they're all they're all doing okay, you know. But I think yeah. that the other the other thing is the Sting Sting is one of these guys that gets very bored. Mm-hmm. You know, he he kind of did it with the police. He didn't want to do the reunion tour. Right. He was kind of forced into it because all the people around him were looking at money, and they said he needed the money, and and um, he kind of went along with it begrudgingly. And um, so I don't think his heart was in in that. And he changed a lot right. of the chords on the songs, and mm-hmm. he changed the key and. I think Andy and Stewart were a little bit resentful of the fact that they say, look, the fans want to hear the songs the way they heard them. They don't right. want to hear it in a new format, you know. Yeah, yeah. Let's do Roxanne the way it was, you know. Right, and, exactly. And Sting, for Sting, that's boring, you know. Yeah. Now, your, your brother did something. Uh, he did a, a Ben-Hur. Yeah, just recently he's done, yeah. he got into doing films, and he's done an opera. And that's so pretty he, cool. He's got to spread his wings into doing stuff, you know. He, he, he has a whole orchestra behind him or something, right? Yeah, I think, you know, the world of orchestras, you know, right. um, they, they like to bring in pop stars every now and then. You know, mm-hmm. I should be working on a project with John Anderson doing that, too, where we might do a orchestra um, project. And, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of bands have done that sort of thing because the orchestras like it because it brings in a new audience, and the, and the right. bands like it because the orchestras seem to have kind of like a prestige symbol thing to it, you know. Yeah. Kind of upmarket and interesting, you know. So yeah, it's 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 always an option that you know the ones that have that musicality can do it, you know. Yeah, I love the orchestra concept. I think it's pretty cool because you get to see yeah, more. We, we have a one that we're working on that with John that I'm, you know, we're kind of dabbling to figure, you know, figure out what's the best way to do. Because you right. know, orchestras are big and you have to fit it in and get the music and the charts. It's not it's not easy, you know. It's, it's got to um, be expensive. But, I mean, you, you usually get the orchestras in the city, right? I mean, yeah, you, you yeah, don't travel yeah. with an orchestra. Yeah. No, it's, it's it's be... traveling with an orchestra would be a real. <laughs> you know, I mean, a small one is thirty-six people. You know. Right. Right. That's got to be expensive so, either way, though, isn't it? To, well, to, you've hired uh-huh. union things, and they have a couple of rehearsals, and, and right. you go in and you do it. You know. So yeah, uh, it's 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 not as easy as going out with a three-piece rock band. That's for sure. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Now, that was uh, that was always the beauty of the police. We just had three guys in a row right. and me, and off we went. You know. <laughs> yeah, pretty easy for Hendrix too back in the day. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> pretty, you know, I could see a movie based on portraying your family. I mean, what an interesting story that would be. You know, I mean, y- y- your dad. Well, I am working on a guy. book. <laughs> Are you working on? You, you need to work on a book, definitely. I'm, I'm about three quarters through, and I'm waiting Good. for. For the last few chapters to kind of come into my head as to what that's going to be. Well, we'll you get know. you back on the show again to promote the book for sure. You know. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And your and your mom was uh, British intelligence. Yeah. They they yeah. Uh, she was in what they called SOE, which was uh, the British uh, intelligence, and they were dealing with you know counterintelligence and German agents and all that. And my father went over as OSS, which later became the CIA, mm-hmm. and that's where they met, and I was the first result of that. And um, yeah, then we then he was stationed in the Middle East and was in, or involved in overthrowing the Shah, and which was a little embarrassing now, I guess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, he 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 worked with Abdul Nasser in Egypt, built the Egypt's intelligence for them under loan from the CIA. He he was you know so he, he his expertise was Middle East Middle East terrorism, all the dictatorships and all that sort of stuff, you know. So uh, I occasionally write for people here when they have. You know, these crazy notions about the Middle East and all these mm-hmm. people making pronouncements about what we should do in Syria or whatever right, else, right. you know, most of which are nonsense. Um, and, you know, all you look at the news services, and they're always bringing up talking heads who, who make their positions, you know. They ask mm-hmm. them, well, what do you think about what's going on in Syria? Well, of course, they have no clue, so they make <laughs> up something, you know. <laughs> exactly. You know, my father's family is from Syria. <laughs> really? You yeah. Speak they're Arabic? They're... Uh, shoya, shoya. <laughs> shoya, shoya. How'd I come out? Eschiatomy. Lazim, talim, 
Keep halak. Shukran. Rocha Babasi is Alan. Wow, you speak good. <laughs> I have the accent because I was I was fluent when I was young. Oh, definitely. My my dad's Jew, my Jewish, so they had to get the hell out of there. They were ousted, and they settled in Brooklyn, New York. You know, the, oh, with the wow, rest okay. of them in Bensonhurst. But uh, yeah, I, my, my I think they were from uh, Halab. You know Halab, which is I think was, is now uh, Aleppo. Aleppo. Like in, oh, yeah, 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 Aleppo. They were in Aleppo. Yeah. So yeah, well, I, uh, yes, I was thrown out of the Middle East three times. <laughs> <laughs> what for? There was some, some revolution going on, and we were advised oh. by the embassy you have to get out within two hours, you know. And so we would we would leave, you know. And then um, so um, yeah. Anyway, but you know, then I go back, and so I lived in Lebanon, Egypt, and Syria, you know. So so that was the. Uh, it's funny. There's like a freedom fighter in uh, over there that actually fought ISIS, and because they're trying to take uh, you know like a, an ancient statue or something away from the city, and they fought him and won, and they kept the statue and they kept everything intact. And his last name is the same as mine, so it's kind of you know Shasho is not your ordinary name. <laughs> so when right. I see that name somewhere, it you know. It's interesting. We might right. have some kind of bloodline or something somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Well, you never uh, know. Yeah. Do you have an assessment on uh, ISIS and what to do about it, or do you have any clue? Well, I think the the major reality is is that think pe- people don't really understand that the Middle East is divided into two really distinct camps, mm-hmm. and that's the, Sh- the the Shia and the Sunni, and then. They're subdivided even more. You have Christian minorities, you have Druze, you have Kurds. I mean, like you've you've heard um, Carly Fiorina and other um, politicians say we should be arming the Kurds. Right. Well, in the pa- today's paper, we we know why we haven't armed the Kurds to the degree that that people are saying we should, because mm-hmm. the Turks are freaking out at the very thought of arming the Turks of the right. Kurds, because the Kurds will. Will pull out, and actually, the the, the president of uh, the prime minister of Turkey is in Ameri- is in New York or Washington right now, heaping abuse on the Obama administration because we are helping the Kurds, you know, mm-hmm. and he he looks upon them as terrorists. So he's he's like they they hate the Kurds, you know, because of, they're afraid that they're going to lose Eastern Turkey, you know. So there's so many things about the Middle East that nobody in America really understands because you know we we don't need to know, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, all the Christians, for instance, support Assad. Mm-hmm. Because he's a he's an Alawite Shia, and he's been very good to the Christians, and he's a minority. Therefore, you know they're all scared to death that the Sunni are going to take over. And of course, ISIS is Sunni, Saudi Arabia is Sunni, Turkey right. is Sunni. Um, so there's all this divide that we don't really understand, you know. And I think that's really the big predicament of the Middle East, you know. And uh, the ISIS people are a, a, an anomaly, but it'll eventually fizzle out, and I think you bomb them a bit, and eventually it'll die out, like like all of them do, you know. But everybody gets panicked for the moment because it makes good news, you know. Right. But I think right. I think what the 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 idea of sending troops in or doing all, uh, uh, taking I think taking out Assad would be a disaster, mm-hmm. J- just like when we took out Saddam Hussein or right. Gaddafi. I you agree. know, those guys they knew they're bastards, yes, but they knew how to hold the place together. Right. I agree with you 100%. You know, that's the reality. So it's, it's a shame to, shame to say so, but the reality is, and now <laughs> people are beginning to say, well, you know, why, where, is, where is Saddam Hussein now that we need him? <laughs> <laughs> Too late. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, you need to talk, you know uh, Steve Hillage, who used to play in Gong? Yeah, I, I don't know him personally. I've met him, I think, years ago. You need ago. to talk to him. He's very much into Middle Eastern music now. Oh, he turned me into, you know, because I wanted to buy some uh, music for my dad. Dad listens to, you know, Um Kasum. Oh, yeah, yeah, I do, too. Uh, hold hold one second. Sure, oh, sure. Oh, i got to call you back. I'm on, I'm on an interview. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, Abdul Wahab. That's Abdul thing. Wahab and uh, yeah. Abdul Hadim Hafez. And, uh, yeah. But I, I know a lot of the newer guys, like Amr Diab and Raghav Alama and... Uh, uh, Oh, all of them. I've got, I, I do a lot of stuff with. I used to do a lot of stuff with Arabic music, not so much anymore. But uh, well, yeah, well, Steve does a lot of you know stuff with the new uh, up and coming artists in the Middle East, and he's very much into Middle Eastern uh, music. 
I can I, I can send you his email if you want if you want you ever want to. Yeah, do do. He's yeah. a nice guy, yeah. really nice guy. Well, I've I done, saw. Uh, mm-hmm, go ahead. I do a lot of stuff still with the Middle East. Um, I because I did this this for for a bunch of years. I put this show together, sort of based on River Dance. Mm-hmm. When Desert Rose happened with Sting, I created a thing called the Belly Dance Superstars, and we had all the top belly dancers in America. We put a show together. We toured. We toured the world. Of course, I needed Arabic music to dance to. Right. So I made deals with all most of the big superstars of the Middle East, and we've got all this music that we still we we, we, we still sell. You know. I love belly dancers. At, at all our weddings and bar mitzvahs and stuff that we went to, I'm, my dad's Jewish and I'm Christian. I'm Catholic. My mom's Cuban. <laughs> Well, that's a mix. Well, I'm funnily a, enough, I'm, our belly dance show, I think four of the girls were Jewish, you know. They're, they're Jewish. That's <laughs> Arabic music. Yeah, I'm a Cuberian. But, uh, you know, I, we always had, you know, really hot belly dancers at all these affairs, you know. It, uh, and, and, and I miss that. <laughs> I really miss that. It was well, really it was cool. fun. Tour. I, had, I had 12 girls and uh, sometimes 14 touring the world. It was a lot of fun, I can tell you. <laughs> And they were great dancers. I mean, we always chose the, you know, really the top ones, and we created a real show. So it was, right. you know, it was sort of like a river dance, but mm-hmm. but uh, but it got me very involved in the Middle East and their music, you know. And yep. so I I got to know all the big stars, and I still do some of some of that music, you know. So, you know, I'm kind of a fan of Arabic music. <clears throat> you know, it's a shame, uh, you know, the Middle East is getting such a bad rap because you know I I knew a lot of good people, you know, and I was in business. <clears throat> My dad had retail electronics stores in D.C. for years and years. And, I mean, we, we dealt with the Kuwaiti Air Force. You know, I, I, I knew people from all over. You know, I knew guys from uh, Abu Dhabi, you know, all, all the places around the world. And very nice, very great, you know, nice to deal with, you know. Um, it's it, it, like, you know, it's a shame they're getting a bad rap. You know, it's, they're not all bad. Put it that way. Well, you know, it's a it's a place where you've got these really big divisions. You know, I mean, yep. I mean, we we act like we don't have it here in America, but if you know, you tune into Fox News one minute and then you switch over to MSNBC and you realize, right. you know what, we got some pretty big divisions in America too. That's right, <laughs> exactly. And I I, I I I always make a point of listening to uh, the, these really right wing talk radio people because I like to right. know what every side is saying. You know. Yep. Yeah, and you listen to some of these guys, and you, whether it be Rush Limbaugh or wherever, and you're thinking, "Wow, they they must think America is a complete disaster." You know? I know. I the know. way they, they, they and you're thinking, "Wait a minute!" But you're all supposed to be this patriotic thing, this and that, you know. Yeah. And and the way they paint everything is that the whole world, you know, America is going to hell, you know. Yep. And you just wonder, well, you know, you realize that the divisions, that you know, people's views can can be completely opposite. So it's not mm-hmm. so strange that in the Middle East they're completely opposite too, you know. Right. The worst is Glenn Beck. I mean, we're, we're going to die tomorrow, according to him. <laughs> you know. Yeah, well, <laughs> he is he is pretty strange. He was even too strange for Fox. They had to move him out. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I think he he had a drinking problem for years. That might came back to haunt him. I don't know. Yeah. You got. Uh, well, there are good there are good people everywhere, and you know they're yeah. they're good Sunni and they're good Shia. You know, but unfortunately. Yep. The people to get the press and the coverage sometimes are the most radical, you know, because the problems are, a lot of the problems are really hard to solve. I mean, you know, the mm-hmm. problem between the Palestinians and the Israelis, you know. Yeah. I mean, there are a lot of people on both sides who want to solve it and are prepared to make sacrifices, but then there's always those little minorities that won't. So right. you got an immovable, you know, it's just pretty near impossible to solve, you know. Unfortunately, Arabs are stuck in their ways. They're very stubborn. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it goes, you know, I mean, I'm listening to Marco Rubio from your state, and he's saying if Hillary Clinton wins, it's going to be a complete disaster for America. And you're thinking, right. wait a minute, is disaster the right word? I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean, isn't that like over the t- disaster? I don't think so. I mean, yeah. you could disagree with some of the points, but disaster? I mean, even under Bush, if, you know, or under Clinton or under you go back over the I mean America has never been a disaster you know a lot not for a long time anyway and and you know no matter who wins you know because there's always those checks and balances you know um but you listen to one side talk and it just sounds like the other is completely off their rocker you know so well like you said maybe that's that's how they sell the news nowadays yeah you, I think, you, I you think gotta, so you news, be, yeah you got to be the news a lot to answer for you know yeah, which is a shame. I miss the days of Cronkite and all those guys back in the day. Yeah. They they just they just you know did the news. They weren't. I didn't think they were biased or anything. I just I just thought they read the news. You know, 
Scott. Well, there was a doctrine called the Fairness Doctrine, which right. really encouraged the news to be mm-hmm. um, not put opinions across. You know, when right, they eliminated right. the Fairness Doctrine, and then they eliminated a lot of the antitrust things, where now stations could be bought up by one group. Mm-hmm. So you have a clear channel. Whoever owned a thousand stations in America or something, pretty soon, you know, people realize you can make money selling the news. So right. all right, let's give people what they want to hear. You know. And unfortunately, that's what's happened, you know. But at the same time, the new technology has meant that, you know, you can listen now to all sorts of interesting music that you probably wouldn't have been able to listen to 20 years ago. You might have to dig a little bit to find it, but it's there, you know. Right. So there are a lot more opportunities musically, and I think those artists that have have figured out that, you know what, let's look at new technology as as an asset as opposed to the fact that it's eliminated our normal ways of earning money. I mean, those artists now can, can, you know, have done interesting things, you know, and, and if, whether it be a John Anderson from, you know, or a whoever, the ones that are out there still looking and still active, I think, I think it's pretty interesting times, really. Well, what was the heyday of IRS uh, records like? Well, I, I, I think my heyday, personally, was the, the one week when the Go-Go's on my record label went to number mm-hmm. one. Yeah, in the U.S. charts, which was the yeah. first time ever a girl group had had a number one album in the U.S. There'd be plenty of number one singles, but never a number right. one album. And the number two album was The Police. So <laughs> I, I was manager of The Police when it was number two, and The Go was the number one. I mean, that week, I mean, that was... That, you my, did okay. <laughs> that was the pinnacle of my career. It's been downhill ever since. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it was great because people we were doing things that that people uh, didn't didn't expect really. I mean, we right. had pretty pretty kooky bands, and yep. the the good thing for me was before people really took it seriously, we could sign these groups for very little money, so I didn't have mm-hmm. to have very much money. You know, once the whole thing kind of broke, and then the kind of bigger money came in, and then it was pretty hard to compete. You know, like when we yeah. we did we did seven albums with REM. Mm-hmm. And then their contract expired, and, and they came to us, me, and said, look, you know, we love your label, but, you know, we're going to go to the open market and see who's going to make the best deal. You can bid, too. And um, I bid pretty high, and I got Jerry Moss from A&M to help me. And then uh, they came to me one day, and they said, look, you know, we hate to tell you this, but we got an offer from Warner Brothers that mm-hmm. said, whatever Miles offers you, we'll double it. Wow. And I looked at the the letter from from the president of Warner Brothers, right? And they they had some of the deal points on there. You know, they gave them the catalog back and this and that stuff that I just couldn't do. Mm-hmm. And I looked at them in the eye and I said, "Guys, here's what I want you to do. I want you to leave this office immediately, get in your car, head straight to Warner Brothers, and make them sign this contract. <laughs> <laughs> and congratulations, you guys right. have done great. You know, and they did. They went to Warner Brothers and they made a hell of a deal. You know, well, but That's you great. know." That the world had woken up to the fact that these bands meant something. Whereas when I did the first REM record, I think it cost me twenty five thousand dollars, and they sold twenty five thousand records. You know. Yeah, yeah. It took them seven years to sell a million. You know, but but right. um, they did. You know. Who who do you uh, are? there any of the music execs uh, promoters that you admired? Like I admired Jack Boyle cellar door concerts because I was from that area and I saw you know a small club owner, you know, turn it into a, a mega promotions business, you know, across the country, which, which which to me was pretty impressive. Yeah, I, I there's a lot of sort of interest. I mean, one thing about managers mm-hmm. is that you know most of us become pretty cynical after a while, you know. <laughs> Right. And and uh people like Elliot Roberts who who does Neil Young and, and who did Cos- Crosby Stills Nash and Young and did Dylan and all these and that, you know. Uh or Doc McGee who does Kiss and whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, you you talk to these guys and they're funny as they can be because the stories and the stuff they've had to go through with this and that, you know. The three of them, I, I I called up Elliot one day and I said look, and, and Doc, you know, I said, Look, let's go do speaker tours. We can keep people laughing for hours. <laughs> and they all said, yeah, let's do it. <laughs> so actually we're thinking about doing that because, you know, people love stories about what really happened behind the scenes. You oh, know? definitely, so, yeah. And and managers, you know, have, have been through, you know, doing great things and then getting zero appreciation for it. You know, and the old the old adage is, I think one manager told me, 
when you first sign an act and you're kind of a big manager, you're like a god. The minute the act happens, you're the janitor. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Or if so, yeah, I think off. all of us all of us have gained a certain cynicism, you know, thinking, yeah. you know. Uh, if a band gets ripped off, they always blame the manager, right? But guys <laughs> like Jerry Moss, who was the M of A&M Records, you know, was such a, such a great guy and, and, and uh, artist-friendly and all that. And, you know, uh, he, he had teamed up with Herb Alpert, and they created this, you know, A&M, and it became a big deal. I've always had right. respect for him. And uh, I've got promoter friends out there that, you know, started – with me really at the beginning um i think one of the lessons i always learned was you know sometimes you know these guys will go up and go down you know but when they're down is the time to be their friend because you know people right. appreciate that and when i was down you know before the police took off you know i had people that just turned their back on me you know and i never forgot it but i had a couple that said hey you know we'll we'll help you out and boy i always remembered that you know so and this is a business where people do go up and down. And sometimes mm-hmm. people think, you know, when somebody's down, wow, well, they're gone. Well, lo and behold, three years later, they're back up again, you know. So, right. <clears throat> you know, never write anybody off. Never. So especially the way the music industry is nowadays. I mean, Absolutely. how how long how long can this last? You know, the dance music and, the, and the, just the singer and rap. I mean, I, I played the first rap song on the air back in 79. That was... Uh, um, Rapper's Delight by the Sugar Hill Gang. <laughs> that was the right. first commercial, you know, rap song. Well, nothing so, ever seems to go away, basically. I think it's it's all there, really, you know. And, and then a new generation discovers it, you know. So. Yeah, yep. I, I just hope, you know, rock can make a comeback somehow on mainstream radio, you know. I, I'd like, because there's a lot of good artists out there. They're just not getting any recognition, you know. Yeah, uh, I'd like to see the musician gain and get more traction. Me I mean, too. I think a lot of it now is, is produ- producers, you know. Right. And and a lot of clever techniques in the studio and, you know, auto-tuning and right. all these weird stuff you can do in a studio. And so, you know, the guy that can really play his instrument. I mean, I, I do a songwriter retreat every year, and I have a lot of top people coming. And we don't even bother to have drummers come anymore because they say, well, why do we need a drummer? It's all on my computer I know. here. I know I don't like that. <laughs> and and the, the reality point? is, they say, well, okay, hey, you want you want your brother on on your track, you know, and and bang, there's Stewart on the track. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, amazing. And uh, that's just the reality of where it's got. Now I hear that people are buying uh, buying holographic rights because they're saying, oh, gosh, you know, we can do <laughs> Michael Jackson in a hologram in ten yeah. years, and uh, you go to the concert, you're not going to see the real actor, you're going to see the hologram. Right, I've heard about that. You know. So, yeah, I mean, technology is, <laughs> who knows where it's going, you know. Who knows, who knows. But there's still, there's still a magic in somebody writing that great song, you know, and uh, in the end it does does require songs, you know, but mm. it's become more and more the fluff around it that counts yep. than, the, than the heart of the song, you know. I, I told Tom Rush this. I said, there, there's nothing like a lone performer on stage playing his guitar and, and telling a story. I mean, that, to me that's everything, you yeah. know. That, that was always true. the magic of Bruce Springsteen. You know, you'd yep. go out and just tell a story, and yep. you'd relate to it, and that's all you needed, really. That's, that's all you needed, yeah. Yeah. Well, winding down, I just wanted to talk a little bit about Copeland International Arts. Uh, tell me a little bit about it and what's going on and what you got going on uh, right now and the future and all that good stuff. Well, we do really kind of two things. I mean, my, my interest, really, I guess, because I, I, I woke up one day and thought, you know what, all these years I've been doing this, I was really making a lot of other people famous, and they owned the business, you know, whether it be the police or Sting or Go-Go's or whatever, you know, those businesses always carry on, and, you know, maybe I had a big part in helping them become famous, but I don't own that business. You can't own people, you know. Right. So I got quite interested in the concept of, you know, if you could own a brand uh, that was not so dependent on an artist, you know, like like Riverdance or... Cirque du Soleil, you know, you don't, you can't name anybody in Cirque du Soleil, but you know mm-hmm. the, the the brand Cirque du Soleil or River Dance or something where you don't know any dancers in it, but you know what right. the show is, you know. Exactly. So I, I that was one area we interested in, and that that sort of concept, you know, we, is, is 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 partly behind the the tour we're doing now, uh, starting this month called Generation X. It's basically mm-hmm. a we we want it to be an annual tour where you know, oh, they're going to be five great guitar players on it, don't know who they are, but they're going to be great, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, we're starting off with names, people like Steve Vai, obviously, but 
we're hoping that after you know we get two or three or four years in, people will buy tickets to the show before they even know who we're having, you know, because they they know we put on a quality show. So that that concept's always been interesting to me, you know, where you can make the concept sell not necessarily married to an artist because artists can be fickle you know a guy can decide well i don't want to tour or he gets sick or you know he break they break up or whatever you know so that's that's sort of what i do but you know and but i don't want to lose my chops in the management world which you know when and when john anderson called me i thought well you know i always liked him and i like john luke and it looks pretty easy and Mm -hmm. i like what they're doing so if i like it you know why not you know so um I'm not really doing new acts, you know. I think it would have to be a pretty stunning new act for me to get excited, you know, because I've been there, done that, you know. Right, right. Um, but, you know, we look for shows and we look for concepts that are interesting, really, in the music business. You know, what's cool is, like, you know, the Pink Floyd Australian show, and I think they have a British show. Those guys are doing really well, you know. That, that, well, you know, the tribute you... bands are interesting. I mean, I have right. one that's a police tribute band, and... Um, the funny, the funny thing was the singer, the the guy doing the singing and bass playing was fantastic, and <laughs> and and he calls me up one day. He says, uh, "My wife's pregnant," and I said, "Well, congratulations." He said, "Well, she's had the had, she's had the babies," and I went, "Babies with an S?" He said, "Yeah." <laughs> uh, I said, "Oh, you got twins?" He said, "No, five. Five? You're kidding me." <laughs> I never heard of it before, but he had he has five kids. Wow! In one pregnancy. I don't know if I can that, handle that, that. That sort of that sort of killed that sort of killed that band. <laughs> so now he's a professor and he ha- at a college in California and he has to he has to stay close to home because he got five kids to work. Oh my about. gosh! Can you imagine? Yeah. Well, you know, I think you're on the right track as far as having those uh, productions, and I guess you own the production company. Is yeah, that, is, yeah. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. We we own Generation X. I mean, we, okay. we we have to we bring guitar players in for that. You know. Right. Uh, we have a couple of dance shows we're working on, and uh, you know some concept shows. I'm actually um, one of the other concepts that we're working on is a female package, and and Belinda Carlisle said yes, she'll do it. Oh, she'll do it, and, huh? And uh, I talked yeah. to Susanna Hoffs, who's yep. not so sure if she would do it, but you know <clears throat> Belinda said yeah, count it. me in. If you get a good package, I'll do it. You know. So we're looking for some some name girl singers from the past to put together in a in a package and. Uh, you know that that sort of thing. That that would be kind of fun. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I talked to Susanna, and she's good friends with Belinda. I that, I could see them both. Yeah, they do. They, they did some shows together. I went and saw them yeah. a month ago, and I thought, you know, Christ, let's do this. You know. Why not? They they, they were great. Yeah. Yeah. Miles, anything else you like to promote? Well, I think that for the moment, I mean, it's it's Anderson Ponty, and uh, right. we're we're pretty ha- happy about what they're up to, and the Generation Axe, which will be touring. I think we might even have some Florida shows, so there are few people should look out for Generation Axe. Okay, excellent. And, Probably, uh, uh, I hope you come to this area, like you know. Tampa, well, I definitely, I definitely, uh, and I know John uh, wants to come down to Florida because he's mm-hmm. done well down there in the past, you know. Yep. So we are we are looking at that in July. We don't we don't have a date yet, but we're we were hoping we could do July. So we'll see. Good. Yeah. I, anyway, you know, good to talk to you guys. And when I finish my book, I'll you. give you a call. I appreciate that. Thank you so much, man, for being on the show right. today. And more care. importantly, for all the great music, man, you you brought well, us and continue to bring. We really appreciate thank it. Thank you. All right, Take Miles. Care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. This. It's at www.performingartsinternational.com, a record company distributed by Universal Music Group uh, Distribution Worldwide, music publishing, show creation, production, marketing, and booking, as well as e-commerce tour merchandising solutions. Purchase the latest release from the Anderson Ponty Band entitled Better Late Than Never at Amazon.com. The uh, album reviews are... Fantastic on Amazon. They're uh, four and a half stars all the way. They've received rave reviews. It's, it's a great album. For more information and tour dates, visit the official Anderson Ponty Band website at www.andersonpontyband.com. Coming up next, best selling author Teresa Haley, who will be discussing her latest book entitled Shining Stars Inspiring Stories and Simple Steps to Empower You to Achieve your highest potential. Join me bi-weekly, Mondays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern, on the Ray Shasho Show, 
very special thanks to Glass Onion PR and the great Billy James for hooking us up today with Miles Copeland, manager of the Anderson Ponte Band, and especially Don and Doug Newsom with BBS Radio for making it all happen every day. If you have comments or suggestions or would like to be a guest on the Ray Shasho Show, call 941-877-1552 or email us at ray at publicityworksagency.com. And don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, The True Story of an Eclectic American Family and Their Wacky Family Business, available now at Amazon.com. You'll live it. Have a great weekend, a week, everybody. Take care. Thank you for listening to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Join Ray Shasho every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on BBS Radio, Station 1.